Welcome to this month's webinar. Thanks everyone for uh, for joining and for all the interest. I'm Miklos Kremzer. I'm the Director of Marketing at Satu Software. Today's webinar is using choice-based methods to segment customers. And our presenter is Dean Tindall. Dean is the Director of Client Services for Satu Software in the UK office. Uh, Dean has been in the world of consumer analytics for the past 15 years. And if you're in the US, you know, uh, especially if you're in the Western part of the US, this may be a little bit early for you. Um, I've had a lot of people from California email me and say that this is way too early for them to, to get up there. Normally, normally get up at noon anyway. But, um, um, and that's because uh, Dean is in the UK and a lot of the participants actually right now are there in, in Europe. So, we're trying to move the time around to make sure that everybody's uh, we can accommodate different time zones and this time um, we have a lot of participants actually from Europe so that's great in fact we had an overwhelming interest in this webinar we had 572 people register uh, to re to listen from actually all over the world so that's fantastic during the webinar a couple of uh, pieces of housekeeping items during the webinar please use the q a window if you have any questions there's also the chat window don't use the chat use the q a and we have a couple of people ready to answer your questions uh, we'll also be sending out a link to the recording and a copy of the slides for everyone when we're done um, they'll be available on the same website uh, you can also sign up sign up on that website it's our it's our website but uh, that will be available around 24 hours after the, the webinar, so FYI. Um, so looks like the people are still joining. So while we're waiting all the, all, for all the participants to join in, I like to make everyone aware of three pretty cool things. Number one, within less than a month, uh, there's the Analytics and Insights Summit that will take place in Barcelona, Spain. That is from May 2nd to the 5th. And this summit, uh, this used to be called the Sawtooth Conference has a fantastic lineup of talks and presentations of the most cutting edge research methods and, and cases. Presenters come from organizations such as Salesforce, LinkedIn, Universal Studios, Procter & Gamble, GFK, Skim. And this is one of the most anticipated conferences in, in 2023. Fantastic learning opportunity and an even better networking opportunity. So hope you can make it. If you're interested in attending, please go to the Satu software Dot com website, so sawtoothsoftware.com, then resources, then conferences, and you, you can navigate to it, but don't miss out on this great event coming up. We'll also put a link to it when the, in the follow-up email when, uh, when we send it out after the, the conference. Second, if you cannot attend, um, you can still have access to the summit proceedings. And uh, before you move, we move on to the Discover, actually, before you we move there. Uh, if you cannot attend the common conference, you can still have access to the summit proceedings. There's virtual options, which is not live. Rather, after the fact, you will be given access to the conference talks. I highly recommend it. Uh, we will be sending out emails on how to register to have access to the virtual conference. So if you if you don't feel like going to Barcelona in May, which could be an amazing opportunity, and if you cannot afford it. Um, with 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 increasing airline uh, prices, then keep an eye out for for the email for uh, for the virtual summit, which could be fantastic. And finally, um, I'd like to make you aware of our latest survey platform called Discover. And Discover is a web-based, browser-based cre uh, survey creation platform um, that doesn't just have the regular question types such as single and multi-select or constant sum but you can set up skip logic, quota control. You can very easily set up a max diff or a conjoint analysis in Discover. And the best thing is you can actually give it a try for free. Um, just head over to sawtoothsoftware.com slash discover. Um, so if you have another browser open right now, for example, you know, or another tab in your browser, go ahead and type in sawtoothsoftware.com slash discover. And you can take a look at this fantastic tool you can, uh, you can um, have a, a, a free version of it. Um, it's actually a, a, a trial, a, a free version that, that has all the capabilities I mentioned, max, if conjoined, et cetera, et cetera. The only limitation is that in the free version uh, that you can uh, field a survey with 
50 respondents max. But it's perfect for you to play around with and see how powerful it is. Um, so with that, I think we have all of the participants now uh, ready. Um, and if Dean is ready as well, then I will turn the time over to Dean. Thank you, Miklos, for that lovely introduction. Um, hi, guys. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to utilize MaxDiff for needs-based segmentations. And we're going to discuss the following topic. So we're going to understand what are the different kinds of segmentations that exist out there, why you should use MaxDiff for need segmentation, how you can segment based on MaxDiff responses. We're going to run through an example project about Navy re-enlistment benefits. And then we're going to discuss how you can create a typing tool for MaxDiff segments. So ultimately, we're going to run through all of this and understand how you can do these things within Lighthouse Studio. Now, firstly, we're going to kick off with what are the different kinds of segmentation, but also what we mean when we say segmentation. And ultimately, when we're talking about segmentation, we're talking about a form of analysis that seeks to place respondents into groups so that within group, everyone is very similar and out of group, everyone is very different. So we're trying to create groups of similarly minded respondents. And marketers use this technique to streamline their resources into targeting as few specific groups as possible. Um, and this really is thought to be more effective than marketing to a single homogenous group and much more cost efficient than marketing on a one to one basis to everyone. But there are different inputs you can use for segmentations, and there's really four key flavors. And these flavors are the demographic segmentation, a behavioral segmentation, an attitudinal or psychographic segmentation, and finally, a needs-based segmentation. And I'm just going to touch on each of these in turn, talking about some of the benefits and the drawbacks. Firstly, when we talk about a demographic segmentation, we're seeking to group together respondents based on similar demographic profiles. So these could be things like age, income, lifestyle and education. And you probably hear these talks about a lot because when everyone talks about millennials or boomers or Gen Z, this is exactly what they're talking about. And this is attractive because the data is easily understood by everyone and it's often easily accessible. And you can really quite easily target people based on their demographics. You don't require fancy analytics and actually future allocation is pretty straightforward. But it's not all amazing. So let's think about a really specific demographic segment. So you can be born in the UK, you can be 74 years old, you can be married twice, live in a castle, wealthy, famous. And even with a very specific segment like that, we can still get two very different people. So here we have King Charles and Ozzy Osbourne. And obviously, if we're trying to attract those two people with the same segment, that's perhaps not going to be the most efficient way to do it. Second flavor we're going to talk about is behavioral segmentation. Here we're going to group people together based on similar behavior patterns. And these can include variables such as channel usage, purchase recency and frequency, customer value or tenure. And, and these are really attractive to companies because this is data that is readily available on their own databases, making current customers easily targetable, doesn't require fancy analytics, and it's pretty easy to allocate people in the future as long as you have the data available. However, it's not all rosy. So a, a previous client of mine segmented customers based on TV box viewing data. They grouped all the respondents together into low, medium, and high watching groups, and then asked us to recreate these viewing segments with a survey. The problem was when we tried to recreate those segments, every single customer fell into the high viewing watching group. And this was because the TV box data wasn't able to account for any outside of that environment watching behavior. So as soon as we left the database, the data just wasn't accurate. And this is why some of these data-driven segmentations can fail as soon as they meet the outside world. So if we're doing a behavioral segmentation, we need to make sure that we are capturing all of the information available and that we can apply equally to non-customers as well as customers. The third flavor, and probably one of the most readily available segmentations in the market, is the attitudinal segmentation. 
Here we are grouping people together based on similar attitudes and beliefs. And these can include variables such as agreement with worldviews, category engagement, channel preferences, etc. And these are really attractive because marketers can form campaigns which speak to these specific target segments. And you can personally design the elements you put in there. However, you do need fancy analytics to create them. You need some form of clustering algorithm, algorithm. A future segment allocation does require another kind of model to create that. But there are problems with attitudinal segmentations. We largely collect the data based on Likert scales, which is subject to scale use bias and high levels of correlation. Because of this, algorithms can struggle to identify the key differences between the groups and really bad clustering can often lead to three segments like we see on the image here, where we get one segment that just scores low on everything, one segment that scores medium on everything, and one segment that scores high on everything. Um, and I'm afraid to admit this happens on more studies than you care to, care to know about. And these can be hard to match back onto database because they might not relate to other harder measures. And finally, a needs-based segmentation, and this is what we're going to focus on today. Whereas here, we seek to group together respondents based on similar needs and desires. And these can include product-based agreement scales or max different conjoint data, which is, which is what we're going to touch on today. And these are attractive because we can identify the diverse need states in the market. We can design inputs to put into the segmentation, which are based on those market needs. And this can allow us to make sure that we've got propositions which are catering to every potential need state in the market. It does unfortunately require fancy analytics to create. A future segment allocation does also require additional modeling too. And whilst need based proposition segmentations can help you determine which of those propositions you need. It might not necessarily help you understand how to market this proposition to the segments. If you're using scales, similar problems with the attitudinal segmentations can, can occur. And these segments are often hard to match back onto databases and they can be quite difficult to create typing tools for, which we will touch on today. And that means that needs-based segmentations tend to be much more strategic in nature than some of the maybe tactical natures of the demographic or the behavioral. Okay, so we've talked about segments and we've talked about needs-based. And, and the other element of what we're going to talk about today is max diff. And you might be asking yourself, why should we use max diff for a segmentation? I'm quite happy using my rating scales to do it. I've been doing it for a long time. It's a straightforward process to me. Um, but to start off the reasons why, let's first talk about the rating scale. It's probably one of the most commonly used survey questions out there. It's the most common way to create attitude and all needs based segments, but they're quite hard to get meaningful differentiation from. And when we are talking about segments and segmentation, we are talking about meaningful differentiation. That's almost all we care about at this point. So answers often have low levels of discrimination. M many people, if they were asked to rate something in terms of important, would say that everything was important to them, with very few items falling below very important. There's a temptation for a lot of respondents to straight line when there's rows of questions like this. It's subject to scale use bias. So someone in Japan or someone in the States would use a scale very differently, and that can cause big problems with segmentations too. We get things like the halo effect, which means we get a high degree of multicollinearity between all of our variables, which means that predictive models and clustering models are very difficult to trust when we're using data which is so flawed like the rating scale. So if we wanted the antithesis of a rating scale, what was the opposite? What was going to drive the maximum level of differentiation? It's not going to have all of that collinearity. What would we choose? Well, we'd probably think about a paired comparison test. In this example, we're asking people to compare two things, and it's a very simple objective. Which one is more important to you, A or B? These are the ultimate drivers of differentiation. We know what they prefer. We, we know the relative nature of it. And we can do these across all of the different questions to understand, OK, what are the big differentiations here? But there's a problem with paired comparison questions. They're just highly inefficient. If we had four items, we'd require six questions to understand all of the different paired comparisons. And when we've got a questionnaire, we just don't have the time for that. If we had 20 items, we would need 190 paired comparisons to have a full data set. And, and ain't nobody got time for that. So if we want paired comparison 
benefits, but we don't want paired comparison drawbacks. The answer is simple. It, it's max diff. We simply ask people a range of maybe three to six items, ask them to tell us which is the most important, most appealing, least important, least appealing of those items, and get them to answer it. Here we've got two clicks on four items, but we're able to infer five out of the six possible per comparisons based on just one question. So we can capture similar levels of information to our inefficient per comparison data, but with a much more efficient questioning method. And because we're doing this, we can drive lots more differentiation between the scores. So here's an example of a five point scale, which is in green versus the max diff scores in blue for the same respondents. And we can see that the max diff scores have much more differentiation in there. We clearly know what they prefer. We know what they don't prefer. But if we look at that five point rating scale, there's just not a lot to go on. So what does this mean for you? Well, it means that each individual max diff question is going to be easy for respondents to answer, and it's going to be significantly more efficient than paired comparison questions. Respondents are still forced to differentiate between items, and they avoid the tendency to score everything similarly, because we don't let them. Scale use biases are eliminated, so we could give the same questionnaire to someone in Japan and someone in Germany, and we'd get the same kind of responses from them. And this enables you to do cross-country segmentation in a way that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with scale data unless you standardize a lot of the questions. And the respondent level scores are going to be highly differentiated, leading to meaningful segment differences. And also as a benefit to this, we get a respondent level fit score. And this allows us to clean the data from people who might have been answering poorly. And that's going to muddy the segmentation that we perform. So once we've got our max diff data, we need to segment it. And we've got a recommended solution for that that's easily accessible within Lighthouse Studio. And this solution that we recommend is called latent class analysis. Now, latent class analysis assumes that there's already segments that exist in your data and they're just hidden. And if we apply the right algorithm, those segments are going to come forward. The algorithm then estimates the probability of all of your respondents belonging to each of these assumed segments and then just basically repeats until it finds the best solution. And one of the best elements of latent class analysis is that gives us a measure called the, Bay the Bayesian Information Criterion, the BIC, which identifies the optimum number of segments for your data, and means that we can understand, OK, how well do our segments fit this data? Therefore, how many should we use? And within latent class, we basically estimate three different things. We get the size of the segments, the likely scores of each segment, as well as an individual's probability of belonging to that segment. So in this example, we can see that we've got two groups. One group likes the option of getting the free streaming service, so three months free of Netflix or three months free of Disney. The other group likes the cash reward, so we can see that via the scores of group one and group two. But we can also see that respondent one has a probability of 85% that they're going to belong to group one and 15% to group one. Group two, sorry. Whereas respondent two has a 97% probability of belonging to group two. So we get an indication of how big these segments are, what scores they have, and how closely each respondent is going to be associated with each of the segments. But how does this work? Well, latent class starts, as with a lot of cluster algorithms, by setting the number of clusters and choosing random initial scores for each group. It uses the, those scores to fit each respondent's data and it computes how likely they would be to belong to each of the groups that we've generated. A weighted logic solution for each group is then estimated using all of the respondent's data weighted by the respondent's relative likelihood of belonging to that group. And we then compute the total likelihood or how well the model performs overall and then repeat all of those steps until the model no longer improves. So what does all of this latent class mean for you? Well, it means that running latent class will identify segments based on the assumption that they already exist in the data anyway. 
you get to specify the number of segments you want the algorithm to explore. And we typically recommend between two and six if you want it to be manageable for your stakeholders. We get a key indicator, the BIC, of how many real segments are likely to exist within the data set. Meaning that, and you can have confidence that any of the segments generated are based on their ability to improve the predictions of the MaxDiff model. So really the segments that are generated from latent class are focused on improving the predictive accuracy of the model rather than with a K-means where it doesn't necessarily have that accuracy to base itself off. So now we've talked about types of segments. We've talked about why max diff, and we've talked about latent class. Now we're going to run through an example project, which is available to everyone. It's, it's in the sample studies in Lighthouse Studio, and talk through the different steps that we go through. So this one's about Navy re-enlistment benefits. So let's assume that the Navy wants to increase re-enlistment rates with a range of potential benefits. They want to know two key things. They want to know how important each of the potential benefits are that they could offer. And they want to know if they can bundle together these benefits in a meaningful way that's going to meet the needs of different types of sailors. And I don't know if you've been listening so far, but this sounds a lot like a max diff needs-based segmentation to me. And when we go through this process, there's going to be seven key steps that we need to think about. The first step we're going to do is we're going to identify the benefits and needs we want to test. We're going to create and field our max diff exercise so we can get that data. We're then going to clean out the poor quality responses so that we can be confident that when we run the latent class analysis, that we've not got any poor responses mudding the water. We're then going to decide on the number of segments that we want to have. And then we're going to profile the results of our segments. And then finally, we're going to think about creating a typing tool which we can use in future studies. So the first step, as we mentioned, is just outlining those benefits you can offer and wish to test. Now, thankfully, the Navy provided, a, was, provided us with their list of benefits, so that part was easy. And we can see here we've got a potential 20 benefits, some of them relating to how long your obligation is when you re-enlist, some of them are related to location or housing assignments, and some of them are related to career elements. And furthermore, we've got things like, okay, you get a, a one-off bonus when you re-enlist. All of these 20 potential benefits are going to be entered into our max diff study so that we can understand the relative importance of each of them. So here's our study. We can take our 20 items and place them in a max diff study. In this example, we're showing four of our items at the same time. And respondents are going to be shown each item three times across 15 different tasks. Now, it's important when you're running a segmentation analysis that you try to ensure that you're showing these items at least three times. Um, if we show it any less, then the respondent scores aren't necessarily going to be as differentiated as possible. Um, three times it seems to be the magic number to get the, the biggest level of differentiation with the least amount of questions in there. And we can run this max diff, we can field it with many other questions in the study. Um, and the first step we're going to do, we're going to take it back and we're going to run hierarchical Bayes estimation at a total level. And what this is going to allow us to do is understand, OK, what's the relative importance of all the items that we tested? And we can look at this chart and we can see clearly that the increased re-enlistment bonus of $10,000 or $5,000 are by far the two most important things on the list. Um, and it'd be easy to assume that the only answer we need to give the Navy is just offer people more money. Um, but government funded institutions don't tend to like that answer. So really, they would be hoping that we could find a different solution. But another benefit to hierarchical Bayes estimation is that it allows us to identify poor quality respondents via a fit statistic that we generate called RLH or root likelihood. And essentially this summarizes how well our model fits the actual choices a respondent made in the data, made in the survey. Now, this is because random responses essentially produce a random model. And we can easily identify whether someone was answering randomly by identifying that our model isn't any better than a random chance. And Sawtooth Software have looked into this and conducted empirical research and uncovered that 95% of the time, if we have a thousand random responses, their RLH score is 0.4 or less. Now, Keith and the team have run this across many different studies with different numbers of items in the lists and have put a great sort of to-do list 
in that link below. So you can use this data to help clean the poor quality responses that you have prior to conducting your latent class analysis. So now we've got our data, we've run our initial model, we've cleaned our segments. We're now ready to use Lighthouse Studio to uncover the segments that exist. And it's as simple as this. We need to add the analysis type latent class to our study. And in the settings tab, we just need to specify the minimum and maximum number of segments we'd like to generate. And then we run this analysis. In this example, you can see that I've set the minimum number of groups of the analysis to one and the maximum number of groups to the analysis of eight. So this is going to run through different segment solutions where there's one segment, there's two segments, there's three segments, there's four segments, there's five segments, all the way up to eight and share the results of all those analysis with me. And this is going to produce a range of different outputs. So here we can see it's giving me the segment sizes and the different scores for, for all of the items for across each of the segments. But for now, we're going to focus on, on one element. We're going to focus on the BIC, that Bayesian Information Criterion. And what I'm going to do with this BIC is I'm just going to chart that against the number of groups. And we can see that we get a nice little curve here where we have BIC on the y-axis and the number of segments on the x-axis. And whilst there's no single agreed upon way to understand the number of segments in latent class analysis, the BIC can give us a bit of an indication. So you can see here that we've got a bit of an elbow at three groups. Um, and this is likely to indicate that three groups is probably the minimum viable number of segments we can go with. And we can also see that the BIC minimizes at seven groups. And this really identifies that seven groups is probably the statistical optimal number of groups. So we definitely shouldn't go above that. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we should definitely go with that one. Because ultimately, the number of segments you decide on is entirely subjective. And this is part of the art of segmentation. So there's a number of things you can look at. So. Does the BIC indicate that your number of segments is in the right ballpark? Can stakeholders handle the, this many segments? So if we go to the Navy with seven segments, are they going to happy, be happy about that? I don't know. Are the created segments large enough to effectively target in the market? If we create a segment that is only 2% of the market, is your client going to be happy that they are now forced to try and target 2% of everyone in the market? That doesn't seem feasible. And finally, are the differences in the utilities or the scores of the created segments actually actionable for your stakeholders? And oftentimes it's necessary to forgo statistical certainty to generate a segmentation which is actually going to make sense and is actionable for your stakeholders. If the segmentation works statistically, but not in the real world, then this is just going to be a failure and it's a waste of everyone's time. So this is really the balancing acts that we take when we do segmentation studies. Now, this is just a webinar. So for simplicity's sake, we're just going to choose the three segment solution. And thankfully, they're all nice and equal size. So they should all be equally targetable by the Navy. We can see we've got segment one, two and three. And they're all broadly about a third of the market. So we put the different scores of the max diff across the segments on here, just in a conditional formatted table that I've made in Excel, we can see that we've got some pretty significant differences in the scores. And hopefully these differences will be actionable to our stakeholders. And, and, and more important to the Navy, we can see that whilst the $10,000 re-enlistment bonus was the most important element overall, it's certainly not the most important element to everyone in our study. We can see that segment two there actually rates it as quite low compared to some of the other elements that are in there. So let's run through the segments in turn and we can see what is driving them to re-enlist within the Navy. And segment one is, is pretty easy. These guys are all about the money. Um, they have the greatest importance placed on the re-enlistment bonus one-offs. They want an increased level of pay when they're up at sea and they want that, oh, that's about it really so these guys are pretty easy they're all about the money we know how to fix those segment two with a much more different segment that we identified in our in our graph earlier and we can see that they're much more concerned with location and housing arrangements so their most important 
benefit was location and duty guarantees for the next assignment, as well as only being obligated for three years. And they wanted choices about whether they lived in a two person or a four person barrack. So these people could be reached with a location based incentive. And segment three, whilst not completely averse to money, are much more focused on their future careers than most. So we can see that receiving online career counselling services or on-the-job time using skills and training or getting promoted six months sooner than expected are higher for this segment than they are for other segments. So we can go to the Navy. We say, great, we've done a segmentation. It's outlined need segments in the market, and there's three of them. One of them is money. We, we can't get away from that, unfortunately. Sorry, guys. The second one is just giving people certainty on where they're going to be and how long they're going to be there. And the third segment is all about giving someone just a bit more focus on their career. And, and this is useful because when we looked at the overall results, we would have been telling them to give everyone the financial packaging. But now the Navy can save money by offering these targeted different needs. But we also need to be able to identify the segment that future sailors can belong to. We can't do the full length max diff for everyone ongoing for the, for the end of time. It's just not an efficient use of surveys in the future. So we need to understand how to create a typing tool. And typically, creating a typing tool is the main barrier of using max diff as a segmentation source. Manually identifying the key questions to ask can be time consuming. And when you're trying to use traditional techniques, it can often perform poorly. I've, I've done it myself. So we need a solution for that. But firstly, we're going to talk about what a typing tool actually is. Now, a typing tool is a way to classify future respondents into your creating segments. This typically involves creating a subset of questions which were involved in the initial segmentation solution, and it allows you to append segments to respondents in any future survey, albeit with a lower level of accuracy. And this can be fairly easy to do for standard survey data like Likert scales using discriminant analysis, and most of you will be familiar with that process. But it can be more difficult to perform this on choice data like MaxDiff. And Sawtooth Software understood this, and they were frustrated too. So they created a tool that can help with this, and this utilizes a technique called Naive Bayes. And it works in two stages. First, it can help you to identify the optimal number of items and tasks which you need to ask, as well as inform you which items should be in each task. So if we look at this chart, we can see the predictive accuracy on the y-axis, the number of tasks on the x-axis, and the colors of the lines are the number of items that we ask per task. So we can see that if we've only got two items per task, it's actually quite hard to get a good degree of pre precision there. Even when we're asking 10 tasks with two items per task, we don't perform anywhere near as well as some of the other models. We can also see that having more items per task is much more likely to increase the predictive accuracy of our solution. So the purple line there is pretty much always the most effective way to assign people into the segments. And we can also see that actually once we ask more than four or five tasks, we don't necessarily see that gain in accuracy that we would have hoped to. So it's not efficient to ask 10 tasks when we can get away with just asking four or five. So once we've investigated this and we've found out, okay, what, what's our right balance of length versus accuracy? Where are we happy? We can finalize that model. So we can select the best model for the study. And in this chart before, we'd say it was using four tasks with five items potentially had the right balance there. And we'd rerun the typing analysis using those choice sets and every possible combination of answers for the max diff. And this can get quite big. Um, and But if we run this with every single possible answer, um, this will then assign a segment to every possible answer. And this means that actually our typing tool becomes a simple lookup in Excel, which will predict segment membership no matter what combination of answers that they used. And this is great because this means we can dramatically reduce the number of questions necessary to replicate the initial segment groups. And it means that actually we don't need a fancy model to predict what segment someone is going. We just need a lookup in Excel that is quite straightforward to use. So in summary, 
there's many different ways to perform segmentation analysis. And each of these have their own benefits and drawbacks. We saw that demographic profiles are really easy to create, but might be a bit broad brush. Um, I'm sure you're all fed up with hearing about Gen Z. Um, we, we've seen that behavioral segmentations can, can miss data that exists in the real world if we're running directly off a database. Um, and we've also seen that needs-based segments can be quite powerful, but we might need to put a bit more work into creating a typing tool from them off the back end. And we found that MaxDiff with latent class analysis is a great way to uncover those hidden segments or, or classes. I've responded preference that existing choice data sets. We've got really large degrees of differentiation in this data and being able to get highly differentiated segments is always one of the goals from segments. And this makes it quite easy to create those highly actionable outcomes for stakeholders. And it really is just a couple of extra clicks when you're in Lighthouse Studio. It, it's not going to take you more than a few minutes to actually run the analysis. It might take you a bit longer to digest it and work through it and make those recommendations to clients. And we have a tool that can help it live on in future studies using our naive Bayes solution. And this can help you create efficient subsets of choice questions, allowing you to have that typing tool in future. So yeah, so there's no excuse not to find those hidden preference sets within choice-based data. And yeah, and I think before we jump into questions, I just wanted to give another shout out to the a &I Summit that's happening in Barcelona this May. Um, me, along with many other like-minded geeks, will be in attendance, and it'd be great to see some of you there. Um, pretty much every presentation is going to be about things like we've talked about today, just great ways to use choice data and other market sciences techniques to help create more actionable outcomes for your clients. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, excellent content. And we we actually had a lot of questions during the uh, during the presentation. And I had, I'd like to thank um, Brian Orm, Brian McEwen, Christina Miller, Keith Sean uh, for answering some of the questions in the Q and A. I think we still have a couple of minutes here, um, Dean. So maybe what we could do for a, for a few more minutes. I know that we probably won't have the time to answer all all questions that that may be coming up right now, but maybe you could pull up the Q&A um, and maybe we could, uh, we could go in and you could go in and answer some of the questions if, if, uh, if, uh, if we can do that. Yeah, just give me a second. So, Jason Grant asks, will this presentation be available after the meeting? And, and, and yes, Jason, this, the slides and the video will be sent to everyone who registered for the segmentation, for, for the presentation, sorry. So, yeah, you will all be getting the slides and the video. Alvaro is asking if this tools will be available in Discover in the future. I think it, it, it's not available right now, unfortunately. Um, but if people ask for it, then it's going to be entered into the pipeline. So um, if you make it known that you want latent class in Discover, then I'm sure the developers will um, prioritize that in future runs. Okay, let, 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 let's do this because I, I do think that there's a lot of questions that I uh, I want to make sure that everybody you know has various levels of questions. You know, some people are looking to uh, to have some training on Max Diff, and some people are look at, they have more advanced questions. So those those people that are new to Max Diff and some of these uh, uh, techniques, we have we have lots of resources on our website. So please go to sawtoothsoftware.com. Um, and, and you can go to resources and, and training, there's webinars, you know, et cetera. So please um, go look at those those first. Um, and then if you so, have so, any, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so Alexander's got a question, which is quite an interesting one, asking, how is this different from a cluster analysis in something like SPSS? And, and, and the main answer of, of why we would recommend using latent class on choice data rather than, for example, clustering the utility scores is that 
there's the potential that we're just going to be clustering on something which already has error inherent in it. So if we're using the utilities to cluster, those utilities will have some error built in based on the respondent answering error. But if we're using the raw answers to, to drive the max diff, then we're potentially segmenting on less error. So that's why we would suggest using latent class analysis rather than something like k-means in SPSS on the utilities, for example. Yeah, one of the things that I'd like to mention that, that we do have a, 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 a typing tool, a fairly rudimentary, very, very simple typing tool that's not part of the product assortment really. But if, if, someone, if someone would like to kind of play with it, I think we can probably make it, make it accessible. And this is probably something, a decision that Brian um, would, would need to make. When I was a consultant, I actually reached out to Brian and Brian was nice enough to share it with me. And I played with it a little bit and I thought it was very powerful, even though it was extremely simple looking. This is not a product that we basically you know, sell or offer, but but we have a lot of big brain people at Satu Software who were playing with it and were, were, were trying to find a solution for it. So there's there is that that rudimentary tool that if someone is interested, you know, we may be able to uh, make it available for them. I, um, I think it's probably I might try and run a session in Barcelona on using a tool that might be a good use of a slot. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, with with uh, with only a few minutes left, I'd like to kind of close it here, and I want to make sure again. Thank you, Dean, for an excellent presentation. Thanks for Brian, or Brian McEwan, Christina, Keith, for answering the Q&A. A lot of great questions, and uh, and all the all the answers. I think we will be able to make it available to all the participants, um, the, so that the questions and the answers will be made available to all the participants. So you can learn also from the answers as well. If you still have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us here at Sawtooth Software. Now, normally I get many emails with this question, but let me address, address it here right now. The recordings and copies of the presentation will be available about 24 hours after the event, and we will email the link to all the participants here as well. Um, we're planning on a series of webinar sessions over the next few months. We'll be announcing the schedule over the next few weeks. So um, you'll be able to find this schedule on our website as well, sawtoothsoftware.com. And on our website at satusoftware.com, click on training, then webinars, and you'll be able to find the, the, the schedule there as well. It's not up there yet, but keep, keep looking for it for over the next few weeks. And we'll also be announcing them in emails as well. So please keep an eye out for all the emails coming from Satu Software. And before I leave, one final word, um, again, about our newest platform, Discover, that is available to to try for free of charge. And that's why I keep uh, keep mentioning it that do, do not um, miss this opportunity. We don't collect credit card information. You can sign in for free. Discover is a browser-based survey creation platform that has all the regular question types, single, multi-select, constant sum, there's skip logic, there's quota control. It's really great. You can very easily set up max or conjoint analysis in Discover. So just head over to sawtoothsoftware.com slash discover. Again, sawtoothsoftware.com slash discover. And the only limitation is in the free version that you can only field the survey to 50 respondents. That's the only thing. It has all the other capabilities that I, that I mentioned. It's perfect for you to play around with and see how powerful it is. With that, thank you for attending. And please keep an eye out for future webinar invitations. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time, guys.